Hi, my name is Melo Kalako and I'm a mindfulness and performance coach. And I'm wrapped to be here today on the online prosperity show here with Prosper. What a great name for this show. And I'm going to talk about today how to beat burnout, how to prevent burnout. I'm going to talk about some of the stories uh, from my book, Beating Burnout, Finding Balance. We're also going to talk about how to find some meaning and purpose in life and a whole range of other things. So stick around to the end. And there's some great stories in here and great to be here. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, where we explore strategies for achieving success and fulfillment in both work and life. I'm your host, Prosper Tarawinga, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing a renowned mindfulness and high-performance expert, Melo. Melo, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Great to be here today. How are you? Fantastic. Now, for those that are meeting Melo for the first time, Melo is an author of the book, Beating Burnout, Finding Balance. He's also a keynote speaker and a facilitator for corporate programs. His transformative work has helped CEOs, leaders, and corporate executives, surgeons, elite athletes, and other high performers to build resilience and achieve the best without burning out. Now, Melo um, also had his own journey uh, of being when he cycled around the world on his mountain bike. And this provided him with the profound insight that he now shares in his work and how he shows up in the world. It's quite a pleasure to have you on the show, Melo. And, um, you know, thank you so much for taking us up on the uh, opportunity to interview now. Now, my first question to you, Melo, is how did your experience of cycling around the world literally help you find your purpose? Yes, it was a two and a half year journey. So it was uh, many experiences along the way, some of them challenging, some of them difficult. You know, I had to rise above adversity many times and I learned many lessons. And many of these lessons are outlined in the book. You know, anything from resilience to you know believing in yourself to having trust in yourself, you know, even to the kindness of strangers around the world that invited me into the world. So I took all of those lessons and, and all of those learnings. I had near-death experiences. I've had machine guns in my ribs. I've had all sorts of crazy stories along the way, as you can imagine. But it's basically shaped me into what I am today. Prior, prior to cycling around the world and trekking around the world, I was just working in sort of jobs that were just sort of paying the bills or you know just not having too much meaning and purpose any job that i could get just to make ends meet but then i realized along the way especially through my meditation practices that i want to share this with the world and this is the work that i do now i teach mindfulness um, i teach meditation i teach resilience i teach a whole range of different things around performance so it definitely gave me the the belief in myself to actually you know, accomplish whatever I want to do in life and just to follow my passion and my purpose. Fantastic. And that's a, you know, a large feat. I mean, I only just flew halfway across the world and um, I can imagine what that will be like on a bicycle. What actually prompted you to get started or embark on this journey? I think I just wanted more out of life. You know, I was living in, living in Adelaide, South Australia, which is a small little town. And um, typically there, there's not a lot happening in many ways and people are pretty comfortable with what they do and you know, just working and buying a house and all those sort of typical things. And I wanted more out of life and I really wanted to you know, challenge myself and put myself into situations where I could learn some lessons. And I was also at the time on a bit of a spiritual quest. I was practicing a lot of meditation and internal martial arts. So I wanted as part of my journey to, to live in monasteries, to live in temples and to immerse myself in the spiritual practices wherever they were, you know, whether it was some of the tribal practices in Africa or, you know, the Buddhist practices in, in Asia or the Hindu practices, just to, to really make up my own mind and to, you know, gather all that information and, and give me some purpose and meaning in life. So it was a bit of a journey of self-discovery and also um, just wanting more out of life, to be honest. 
Fantastic. Now, looking at this, I mean, in the tribal places that you would have gone to, Melo, I think you would have experienced or had of tales where people do what's called rite of passage or initiation uh, sort of ceremonies, something that in the first world is, you know, not a very common practice. And hence, we now have a lot of people that are fully grown babies because they haven't been told, hey, it's your turn to lead. Would you think that this bicycle journey would have been your own initiation process or have you had uh, instances like that prior? Yeah, it's a good way to put it in some way. It was a bit of a rite of passage you know, in, and in many ways. I did see many rites of passages in Africa. I, I recall coming into a town and, and it was a lot of madness. It was, I think it was in Cameroon, actually, and there's a lot of craziness and madness and they'd been drinking some local um, alcohol to you know, spur up this event. And there was people charging us with scary masks and things like that. And it turned out to be a circumcision um right of passage and I was like I think I better go the other way here <laughs> before something happens here but it was pretty scary it was pretty pretty frightening and also in other in other parts of Africa you know witnessing um voodoo sort of rituals and and uh, healing rituals where you know people would stay up overnight or even like three days in a row and um you know get into this state and and doing healing rituals absolutely amazing so yeah I, I saw many different rites of passages and in some ways this was my my rite of passage in some way to to actually put everything that I've got together in my life and 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 learn from other people and other cultures so that's a good way to put it. I've never heard it put like that fantastic I mean obviously while you're doing things in life or growing up or working like you say people uh in your area just do the usual get up go to go to jobs they don't mm. like go to work um or do things that they don't really like which then causes a bit of burnout and we're going to be touching up on how you then wrote that book there but my last question around the trip what what, what was your biggest highlight something that you wouldn't change for the world that actually um you know happened to you at um you know while you were going around the world on your bike Mm, it's a good question. And most people, when they ask me about my trip, ask me about the challenges, the difficult situations. And and yes, I had many of them. Like I said, I've had you know near muggings and near death experiences. And they're always interesting. But for me, the highlight in many ways was was the kindness of strangers. You know, really how that you know really shone to me. Some of these countries and some of these places where you cycle into and they've got seemingly nothing, they've hardly got enough food for themselves hardly got clothes on their back, but they open up the doors for you and let you in and give you anything. And yes, I got sick along the way because of that. You know, yes, I was you know eating local food and being invited into homes, but that's definitely a highlight. You know, up through the Himalaya, when I traveled up through the Himalaya also, again, you know, very high altitude, um, seemingly nothing, no, no clothes or no, hardly enough food to eat because not much food grows up there. But there's uh, some situations where I was invited into homes and they gave me their food that they would even you know, spare from themselves to make sure that I was fed. There was a situation where I got an infected toe and I got stuck in a um, a village in on the Tibetan plateau in Ladakh and you know, I wasn't well and they cared for me like their own child, basically. They sacrificed their own food to give to me. So that was something that really stuck out to me in many ways. That's It's like the kindness of strangers and opening up their hearts to you and opening up their homes yes i had to sometimes drink yak butter tea you know in these little villages yes i had to drink some you know local food and things but i wouldn't trade that for the world fantastic i can imagine um for myself growing up we grew up around a culture that um you know is em emphasizes ubuntu i don't know if you've ever heard of mm. that concept that i am because you are and just for the reader or th the listener who's watching this now ubuntu is a concept that if if mellow wasn't here i wouldn't have this show and if i wasn't here mellow wouldn't be talking to me so can you imagine situations and examples in your life where other people actually make you who you are so if you're um, a coach or a leader within in your business the people that you are leading if they didn't exist you wouldn't be a ceo because you wouldn't be a ceo to your kids so that's where most of these highlights you know really really start taking shape because it's because of the people around us that we are the kind of people that we are and i'm glad 
that you had to experience that firsthand. I mean, obviously, if you're in different areas, um, the altitude, the climate and the food might not be what you're used to, but that's just your body acc acclimating. And I'm happy that is part of what you took out as a highlight. Now, let's go back to reality and get out of the jungles of <laughs> places <laughs> where you be. So you came back. And you wrote a book um, and it's basically beating burnout and finding balance. Um, what, what, what prompted this book? A few things. So it's been culminating in my mind for a while. So the, the work that I do as a performance coach and, and mindfulness coach, I work with many companies you know, from the lar largest organizations on the planet to you know, smaller businesses. And during the pandemic, actually, um, I supported many people in my seminars and workshops that I do. So, um, yeah, there was a big need and there's a lot of burnout and there's a lot of mental health problems and mental health issues during that period. So I did, um, I think I supported over 75,000 to 80,000 people in that one and a half year period alone. And most of my work is in-house. So most of my work is in the company. So people know me in the company, whether it's the big four banks or the, you know, whatever other industries they are, but not many people knew me outside of those four walls. So I thought I want to reach more people. Yes, that was 75,000 people, but I want to actually reach even more. And that's where the book was born. I thought if I can publish a write and publish a book, then that will reach the, the everyday person, you know, someone can pick it up at the airport bookstore, bookshop or you know, can pick it up and they can take it home and read it. So I guess it's from an innate need for me to help as many people as possible to beat burnout and find balance in their life, because it does hurt me when I, I go into an organization and I look around the room and I'm running a seminar or a workshop and I just see so many people are tired and exhausted and, you know, their mental health problems are, you know, affecting them and their families so if i can help them to then you know be better people and to find meaning and purpose in their life and to beat burnout then that can also have a ripple effect a bit like your ubuntu example there you know that can spread out to other people and um and share that with their families so that's where the that's where the book was born and and i was actually quite surprised because i i am um, I made a proposal for Wiley Publishing Publishers, so um, and I thought it was going to take ages to do so. But before I knew it, I had the book in my hand because they gave me a very short turnaround. It was like a nine-week or ten-week turnaround to write the book from the beginning to the end. So I almost know what my next book's going to be, how I nearly burnt out writing a burnout book. <laughs> 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 because it was tough. But, um, yeah, it's out in the world now. And what I really love about the book is I'm getting – emails and uh, texts and messages from people all over the planet you know from high up in Iceland or Antarctica to you know, Africa India Asia and you know sending me messages of thank you for the for the book so I love that this book is reaching the world far and wide absolutely and I would really want to say this on behalf of the world thank you for your service especially and you know raising up to the occasion all right um going back to my culture again we have this saying or statement or feeling or way of life that during peacetime they are peacetime leaders and during wartime they are wartime leaders and a lot of people mm in maybe the first world or so are peacetime leaders. They know how to be leaders in a calm environment, but you took it upon yourself. And like you say, you nearly burnt out while you're really <laughs> trying to put the word out there, which is fantastic. Now, coming back to my question, a lot of people don't quite realize when they are actually burning out. Like fish does not realize that it's in the water. We don't see the air that we breathe. In, and it takes somebody from outside, like yourself, an external consultant, to then show them, hey, you, Sally, you're burning out. Hey, you, Tim, you are actually burning out. What are some of the common signs and symptoms of burnout and how can individuals combat them? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's a question that I actually posed when I was actually writing the book. So as I was writing the book, I, I interviewed over 200 leaders, you know, CEOs, executives, and a whole range of people. And you're exactly right. Most people don't realize they're burning out until it's too late. So most people don't see the signs, the early signs, or they see the signs and they ignore them and they just keep charging on through, or they see the signs and they don't know what to do about it. In fact, 90% of the people that I interviewed did not realize they were burning out until it was too late. 
ninety percent. So the early signs actually of burnout is you know the, the typical signs that we see the stress signs, and they can be tightness of the chest, they can be tightness in the shoulders. Typically, wherever you feel stress, some people feel it in their jaw, some people feel it in their head, they get headaches and migraines. Some people feel it in their in their belly, their gut. Some people feel it in their body, aches and pains. So the very early signs are usually the physical ones, you know, the physical ones that we get with stress. But unfortunately, most people ignore them. And I always use the analogy, it's a bit like driving the car and you're driving the car along and then the oil light pops up and starts flashing at you. And then the petrol light says, hey, we're running out of petrol, but you just keep going. You just keep driving. And that's exactly what people do. People see the signs. They see the signs of fatigue. They see the signs of exhaustion, but they just keep trying to charge on through. So that's the physical signs. They're usually the first ones, the most obvious ones. And then there's also the the emotional signs where you know, people feel a bit detached you know, from the work that they're doing. They might feel a bit disengaged. They might withdraw a little bit. They might be a bit um, reactive even, a bit snappy because they're just tired and their resources are low. And also the behavioral ones, again, they might withdraw. They might not show themselves on the Zoom screen, you know, on, on the Teams meeting screens. So there's a whole range of physical, emotional and behavioral symptoms that we see but very often, you know, we ignore it. I often use the saying, you can't change what you don't notice. You know, so the very first step is building that self-awareness, that self-awareness of, oh, okay, I'm feeling a bit stressed now. What do I need to do? And sometimes CEOs, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, high achievers, high performers are their own worst enemy because they don't stop. They don't pause. They don't give themselves permission to stop. And they just keep charging on through. And then the end consequence is poor mental health and burnout. So it's a, it's a progression. What I see in the work that I do, it's a progressive scale. You know, it starts off with just normal stress, then it turns into chronic stress, and then that chronic stress turns into what's called allostatic stress, which is that constant wear and tear on the body and mind, and then that turns into burnout. So that there's an evolution of stress, and the quicker we can catch it in the earlier stages, the much better it is. Absolutely. And I really appreciate you uh, explaining that about the book. Now, while you're talking about the check engine light, I always thought that's a little um, lamp where you can actually rub and the genie comes out and you can get your wish come true. So it it seems like that's not exactly what that is. So <laughs> from, from that, I think I've actually changed the mindset of that, that uh, if you see the check engine light coming up, then that means this stuff is going to cost you, right? Yes, so yes. you've mentioned that a lot of people are just walking mindlessly and uh, not really paying attention to, you know, the signs and symptoms like you have elaborated there. Now, what sort of strategies do you then share to help people create this harmony and how they work and actually define their version of success? Yeah, first of all, that, Self-awareness piece is important. Like, like it's, people don't realize they're burning out until it's too late. So the first the first step is to build that self-awareness. Self-awareness as a leader is the number one asset that we need. Self-awareness in regards to emotional intelligence is the number one asset that we need. So the first thing we need to do is to develop our self-awareness, introspect a little bit, get to know ourselves a little bit, get to know what are our buttons that get pushed, get to know the, the triggers that trigger you into a stress response and get to know the mechanisms you need to get back to that healthy zone. So in many ways, mental health is a spectrum. And, you know, there is, you know, well, and there's the other end, burnout and poor mental health. And you need to know yourself, where are you on that spectrum? So you can actually get yourself back to that healthy and well zone. So the first strategy is self-awareness. The second strategy is giving people some tools so they can self-regulate. So if they are feeling stressed, if they are feeling tired, if they are feeling exhausted, you know, what can they do in that moment to self-regulate? Whether that is a meditation practice, whether that is doing something for themselves that makes them feel good, whether that's going for a walk or whether that's having a meal, what do I need to do in this moment to self-regulate? This is one problem of the world that we live in now because we're moving at such a unrelenting pace we just keep going and going and going and going expecting you know more performance and productivity but sometimes the very thing that we need to be more productive is to stop and pause and self-regulate i teach what's called a 90 second breath break 
90 seconds, 90 second breath break. And what that does, it de- it down regulates the amygdala, the stress center, and it fires up the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain. So you can actually reset your mind and reset your body. And even 90 seconds can change your life. So if you stop for 90 seconds, your next two hours will be more productive. So that's the next piece is self-regulation. That's important. And the last one that's most important to prevent burnout happening even in the first place is self-care, consistent self-care. And self-care, yes, we know that the obvious ones, that's, you know, making sure you're eating well, you're sleeping well, you're exercising, you're meditating, you're doing your hobbies and interests, but also having self-compassion and being kind to yourself, you know, looking after yourself. So those three things, self-awareness, self-regulation, and self-care are the strategies that I teach um, in in depth, obviously, in more depth. Um, Absolutely. And obviously, with the way that, um, you know, things are going on in the world, like you've said, we're in a really fast-paced environment where everybody's literally running just to stand still. Um, You know, it, it becomes such a shared problem that people don't quite see this and um, take time to actually, um, you know, put that in perspective. Now, what are your thoughts on maybe work-life balance and how can individuals maybe achieve it in today's fast-paced world? Yeah, in the book, I talk about the different domains of, of life. And, you know, there's there's work and career. There's there's sort of eight domains or eight, eight, eight areas that we look at. There's hobbies and interests. You know, there's financial well-being. There's relationships. There's social relationships and a whole range of you know, other areas and pillars of our life. Most people, when I ask people about work-life balance and I ask how much of your mental energy is spent at work and how much of your mental energy is spent at home, unfortunately, most people are like 80-20 you know, 80% work, 20% home. And of that 20% home, most people are, you know, are sort of just exhausted and tired. So they don't, they don't have any energy to do those things. So the first thing I do is to, to reclaim those pillars, those different pillars, making sure you're, you know, you're socializing, getting social support, making sure you're doing your hobbies and interests, making sure that you're, you know, eating well, sleeping well, exercising, all of those things. And the biggest one that I, that I'm sharing at the moment, definitely with the hybrid workplace is to create clear boundaries, you know, crystal clear boundaries. Am I working or am I home? You know, am I on? Am I performing or am I relaxing? And most people aren't relaxing, unfortunately. They'll, they'll say, I'll just quickly check my emails after dinner. You know, you have a nice meal and then you quickly check your emails or you look at your phone. And then before you know it, you're responding to emails. And before you know it, it's 10 o'clock at night and you're still working. And it's so easy to work all those hours. And then you can't sleep at night because you're thinking about work. And then it has a flow on effect to the next day because you're, you're not functioning well. So it's really about reclaiming those pieces of, of life pie or the life wheel. And what can I do each day? Often when I interview CEOs and executives and I ask them about their hobbies and interests, most people say, oh, I used to do that or I used to do this but they don't do it anymore because they just get so caught up in the treadmill of life. And once we start reclaiming those things into our life, we start finding balance. Because if if you're getting nines and tens, let's say in work and career, and you're getting twos in your home life, in your your exercise or your your social relationships, then that wheel is not going to turn very well. So when it comes to work-life balance, it's not just work and home, there's different areas of our life that we need to look at. And even if we do one thing towards them each week and just start building up that balance there. So there's a there's a fair bit to it. So it's a matter of like, you know, making sure that you're diligent with your practices. What happens when we get stressed, and this is what I've noticed in the coaching work that I do, when we get stressed, when we get busy, when we get tired and exhausted and we've got a big project, the first thing that we do is let go of the things that we need the most. I won't go to the gym today. I'm too busy. I'll, I'll just eat on the run because I'm. I've got so much to to do. Oh, I won't. I won't have. I won't go see those people on the weekend because I've got so much work to do. I won't catch up with you know my friends after work because I've got too much to do. So these are the things that we need the most. It's usually, it's a it's a reverse equation. If we do these things, exercising, eating well, sleeping well, you know, socializing, and our hobbies and interests, we'll actually perform better. So that's how we find work life balance is to reclaim those little areas of our life that we neglect when we get busy and stressed. 
Absolutely. Like you say, there's eight dimensions to us for us to be complete. You know, it's your spirituality, your mindset, like you say, physical education and all of those things, your health, your wealth, the relationships that you have and so on. And um, obviously with those aspects, you know, there's certain societal expectations. You know, I'm supposed to be a dad that has these certain amount of kids. These kids have to act this certain way. My wife has to look a certain way. My business has to look a certain way. My career has to look a certain way. I have to drive a certain type of car for me to be at least accepted amongst people that are actually burning out themselves in society now he while you were on your journey you used to define success in a totally different way i mean obviously you would have tried to climb the rungs of the corporate ladder and you just realized that you know you can't climb the ladder of success with your hands full now has your definition evolved throughout your journey on how you define success no i don't think it's evolved i think it's actually enhanced in many ways so for for me success means if I can put my head on my pillow at night and go to bed and have my family in their house and I can say I help someone today or I help some people today and my this might sound cliche or corny but one of my goals in life is to leave the world a better place than I found it to actually leave this planet better than I found it so every day my mission is to help as many people as possible. So my definition of success is if I can go to bed at night, put my head on the pillow and say, I've helped someone today, you know, through stress, I've helped someone manage cancer, I've helped someone, you know, in situations, then that's successful. If money comes from that, great. You know, if all the other security comes from that, fantastic. But that's my definition of success. And it's an internal motivator. You know, for me, it's intrinsic. It's deep down inside of me and that feeds me and that nourishes me. And yes, I get paid for it and I love doing what I do, but that's not the reason that I do it. It's to help as many people as possible to leave the world a better place for my children, actually. So for my children's children, even. So that's my definition of success and, and I'm sticking to it. And it's what drives me every day and it what it's what motivates me every day from the inside. Absolutely. And the more you do good things, um, you know, for yourself, it has that ripple effect that we were talking about earlier on. And yes. uh, just taking from your story of traveling around the world, you would have inspired a lot of people, you know what I mean? And uh, so many people would have been in awe that, wait a minute, this person came from across the world on their bike and you would have had so many conversations uh, emanating from that. Me being here in Australia, Mellow, was the influence of a teacher that came to my school when I was 13 and I literally uh, took it upon myself to also want to be, do and have uh, what she had. So you never know who you would have inspired. And even the people that are watching uh, this show right now are already maybe wanting to jump ship and um yeah go to the bike shop buy the best <laughs> bike they can get so they can also maybe go on their journey uh halfway across the world but there are some people that are about to get the remote right now and switch to the next video or skip this video to something else because they are thinking to themselves i've got a mortgage i've got kids i can't be that what you're saying and this is my life i can't change who i've become what sort of advice do you have to someone who feels stuck in their current situation and is struggling to really find passion and potential yeah it's a really good question and, and a long one too that this could this could be an hour of discussion but in short it's finding out what what really drives you what motivates you so we talk about intrinsic motivators and extrinsic motivators so extrinsic motivators are more like money and wealth and status and all those things you talk about before which can be nice things but they never end you know how much money is enough money how much wealth is enough wealth how many great cars do you need sitting in the garage so if you're extrinsically motivated there's never there's never an ending to that it doesn't end it's like i want more and more and more where where if you're intrinsically motivated and if you can find some of that drive and purpose inside of you and usually what it is it's values based so if high on your values is family, let's say, or high on your values is helping people or high on your values, whatever it is that's high on your particular values base, then that's what motivates you from the inside. 
So spend some time with yourself to get to know yourself. If you're comparing yourself to others and wanting what they have, then you may be disappointed. But if you can be content in who you are, what you are, and how you can use that as a service towards the world, then you can find that. And sometimes it's just a simple thing as just sitting down with yourself and listing out your values, like listing out your top five values. You know, what are they? You know, for me, their connection, their family, their joy, their happiness. So in my trek, in my travel, I made sure that I was exercising those values, connecting with other people. And you mentioned there, yes, I was inspired. You know, I'm inspiring others in my travel. So when I was traveling around the world, I was inspiring others. But in so many ways, I was inspired by other people the other way around. So that exchange, that that inspiration exchange, that energy exchange. I was I was inspired by, you know, small little pygmy tribe that I stayed in, in in Cameroon, for example. Again, how they had nothing and gave gave us everything. I was inspired by the people that pretty much give you the shirt off their back, you know, to keep you warm. I was inspired by so many things along the way. And that's what we have to find, that sort of deeper inspiration. What drives you? So my advice is to for people is like, what drives you to get out of bed in the morning? You know, what motivates you? What helps you find purpose? And sometimes what I find when I'm coaching people is it's not always their work. Sometimes they think they have to find purpose in their work. Yes, it's a blessing if your work can be part of your purpose. But some people I know, for example, they might work in a financial institution and they make good money doing that. They get a good salary. And that salary helps to drive their purpose. They may they may want to help the children in Rwanda or whatever it is. So that that can actually have a um, a dual effect with the money they have, the security they have, can actually help to drive their purpose. It doesn't always have to be their work. So that's the that's the definition that I look at. Looking for those internal values, looking inside a little bit, reflecting a little bit on what drives you, what motivates you, what gives you joy, basically. You know, ask yourself the question, what gives me joy? And everybody will have a different response. And that's the stuff we need to work on. That's the stuff we need to share with the world and, and have that ripple effect around the world. Absolutely. I hope that's answered it to some extent. <laughs> Absolutely. So from what I'm here, we got to do a lot of, um, you know, uh, acts of kindness to ourselves in order for that to then translate into um you know us helping other people and in essence it's not necessarily about finding purpose in what you do but who you are becoming can actually be um you know maybe a, a standard or some sort of model for other people to actually envy and see hey wait a minute maybe i could be like a mellow maybe i could be like uh prosper now if people are watching this mellow and they're really now they're warming up to um maybe cycling around the block and maybe you know expanding that journey a little bit there what would be the first thing that they can do to actually get in touch with you uh or what can you offer them to uh maybe get started on their uh, intrinsic journey to self-discovery like you did yeah sure i run a whole range of you know workshops and a whole range of um lunch and learns for example in corporate companies and I just want to reach as many people as possible. Like I said, I'm on a mission right now to help as many people beat burnout and find balance in their life. So the first point of call, I would say, is the book, of course, you know, Beating Burnout, Finding Balance. And you can actually download a, a totally free sample chapter of that on my website, mellowcalaco.com. I'm sure they'll be that'll be in the show notes. And in that, in that the sample chapter, that one's all about self-awareness, actually, that I was talking about before. That is the very first step, you know, building self-awareness. So the very first chapter talks about self-awareness and mindfulness and how we can, you know, introspect a little bit and find that. And I share a story in there from um, my travels um, when I was actually caught in a storm and um, I, I got hit by a tree, hit my bike over, damaged my cook set, damaged my tent, damaged me a little bit. And um, the only way that I could survive that storm, there was there was no shelter around me at all, was to meditate for 12 hours. So from dusk till dawn. So I meditated for 12 hours and I went through all sorts of, you know, different brain frequencies and things. And I survived that situation, which for me gave me the belief in the power of meditation, the power of mindfulness and the power of the breath. So if you want to hear that story, you can download that, that free chapter, um, on my website, mellowcalaco.com, M-E-L-O-C-A-L-A-R-C-O. 
and I'm sure they'll be in the show notes. And also, if you want some free meditations, I'm on an app called Insight Timer is another way to do that. But probably the best point of call is jump on on my website, get in touch with me. I'd love to hear you know, your story. I'd love to hear if we can if we can work together. Just love to see if there's any way that I can help you. I'm just interested in people and connecting with people. So website's probably the best point. Fantastic. And thank you so much for such a generous offer, a free chapter from your book. Uh, and for those that are going to be interested in getting uh, more of that, I will definitely have that information in the show notes and also a link to the app where you can actually learn more about uh, mindfulness. But I'm still hung up, Melo, on uh, what you said a little bit earlier on <laughs> before we wind up the show, um, where you said that, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to find your purpose in something that is uh, intrinsic or something that is in your job or, you know, things of that nature. You know what I mean? And um, uh, you could actually use your salary to make a difference. And I viscerally believe that uh, we're here to leave, we're here to learn and we're here to contribute. And I'll just explain those three aspects a right. little bit where you're leaving the best life possible um, that you possibly can, mindfulness and everything else with no burnout. You know what I mean? There is a life like that for those that are watching. And you're mm. learning along the way, you know, learning from people like Melo, learning from other people that you meet along the journeys and, and, and the parts that we take. But then there is a contribution aspect where you actually help others be, do and have a happier existence. And you have also started on a journey to contribution where um, you have your philanthropic uh, endeavors in, in Africa and in the Nepal there. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, philanthropic efforts and how your work actually contributes to building schools and education facilities in Nepal and in Africa? Yes, I was so touched by the children of the world, really touched. They they stole a piece of my heart, you know, the smiles in Africa of the, the little children. So we definitely wanted to give back. You know, I'm, I actually met my wife in, in Africa um, and uh, she had already had some um, involvement in a in a foundation actually in Kigoma, which is in Tanzania. And um, so we actually extended that. We have children there that we look after. But no matter where I am in the world, it doesn't take much to give. It doesn't take much to actually, whether I, I go to a school in Cambodia, let's say, and give out some pens or you know teach them English or do those sort of things, it doesn't take much at all. We've done everything from digging wells in Africa, you know, to give running water, you know, to providing education. Um, and also I'm involved with a, a friend of mine in the US in New York called Children We Serve, and it's a foundation. And what we do there is, um, for example, after the Nepal earthquake, so after the earthquakes that you know damaged nepal we rebuilt schools and we actually you know doing work around there where the some of the money that i make from the corporate work that i do it goes back into that so it doesn't take much to give back it really doesn't and all these projects that are going i just love to receive emails and texts and um even letters handwritten letters i got one recently a handwritten letter all it said on there was thank you 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 they must have just learned how to write thank you in english and it's like that warms my heart that's exactly what i do the work for so yes if i can give back from the work that i do in some small way that can again have that ripple effect around the world and it, and it doesn't take much that's the thing sometimes you know, someone might ask me the question let's say they're an accountant you know in a financial institution i say how can how can i find purpose being an accountant like you know accountants are a boring job well, you can by just giving a little bit back or even you are helping people with their finances and those people can help other people. Yeah, so we all have those things inside of us. A lot of us think it's too hard to exercise. They think it's just too difficult to actually contribute. And the word I love the word contribution that you said there, but it doesn't take much. Just a little piece that you can do can change someone's world. Absolutely. I'm going to say something to you and I hope it's going to mean something to you. Please. Muzungu. Muzungu, yes. <laughs> that's that's me. I'm a Muzungu. <laughs> yes. Santa Sana. Anyway, um you, you. Melo, all right. You have won the lottery. You've 
completed everything anyone could ever expect in life. Cycled around the world. You've written books. You're now living a fulfilled life. Um, you obviously mentioned your wife. That means you are obviously happy with the relationships that you have. You're contributing. You live in places where people only dream of. Mount Martha and Victoria is one of the most picturesque uh, areas in the world. Um, what, what's next? What What are your future plans? I mean, what what do you give somebody who has already got everything they need for Christmas, like you? And um, you know, how do you how do you see yourself making a difference? Um, to to what you've already done in 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 life or in other people's lives. What's next? Yes, yeah. I'm not too concerned with what what's next. It's like what now, and really enjoying what I'm doing right now in the present moment. And right now is my children. I have two beautiful daughters, and you know, living through them and sharing some of these values and things is what drives me. They are horse riders, so they ride horses. I don't. I ride bikes. Um, but they want to take me across, you know, trekking ac- around the world on a horseback. So, so maybe what's next could be crossing the Gobi Desert on the back of a horse <laughs> or Mongolia or something like that. But for me, it's just to continue to contribute, you know, in in the work that I do in any way shape or form if I can make a small difference to some people it's just continuing that journey following my passion following my purpose yeah and following my drive to do that so and I'm I'm living that through the children now and sharing that through my through my young daughters and if if I can leave them a better place like I said to live in and that's the that's the job that I'm doing but I am always look I am getting itchy feet I must say I'm getting pretty comfortable here in Australia is a very comfortable country you know and it's very sort of insular in many ways and it's far away from the rest of the world so i'm getting hungry for another expedition i'm I'm actually thinking of north pole to south pole so um heading north to south i'm not sure on what mode of journey it might be horses it might be camels it might be elephants it might be bikes or a combination of those things but i'm always looking for the for the next adventure fantastic well let me tell you something the world's your oyster you go in and make your mark as you already have with the bike and everything else. Now, I can't thank you enough, Melo, for the time that you've spent with us on the show today. Thank you. That's a pleasure to be here. We could easily keep talking for another hour, I'm sure. I'd love to hear some of your stories and your background on how you ended up here in Australia. You start, You just started sharing a little piece of that. I'd love to hear more of that. Fantastic. Well, I've got one thing to say to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) It's my pleasure. It is my pleasure. My pleasure to be here. And thank you for having me as a guest. Absolutely. And also thank you to our viewers that are watching right now. We've just had the pleasure of speaking to Melo Kalako, a mindfulness and high performance expert. Uh, We talked about combating burnout, achieving balance, and finding success without sacrificing uh, well-being. So Melo's book, Beating Burnout and Finding Balance, is going to provide you with valuable insights and strategies for those individuals that are looking to thrive in their personal and professional lives. Now, to learn more about Melo's work and his book and his corporate programs, be sure to visit his website. We're going to put all that information in the uh, comments below, and you definitely have to check out Beating Burnout, Finding Balance. And I'm supposing it's on Amazon and on Booktopia, right, Melo? Yes, and if you're in the US, on Barnes & Noble, and there is also an audiobook version. I recorded that with my voice. And a word of advice for anybody that's making their own audiobook, do not use the word similarly in your book because I could not pronounce it for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, fantastic. I'm going to try similarly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Well, for that reason, you definitely have to just buy that audiobook just so you can have a bit of a laugh. And uh, if you can pronounce similarly better than Melo, then at least you've done one thing that he can't do. For somebody who's (laughs) reading across Australia and is doing remarkable things for the kids, um, you know, in Africa and Nepal. Now, thank you so much again, Melo, for your wisdom and transformative experiences that you shared with us today. And it's been truly inspiring. For those that are watching, 
be sure to subscribe to this show so you don't miss out on inspiring stories of people that are being, doing, and having a happier existence. Bye for now.